to change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. The shift that we're now seeing pick up storm, uh, pick up steam, excuse me, all over the country um, would not have happened without the organized blood, sweat, and tears of activists here in Seattle and for many generations prior. And just like it took many of them to make this shift happen, the shift of recognition happen, it took many people to make this event today happen. Um, I'd like to acknowledge student leadership, multicultural services, the president's office, cooperative education, the SEC library, American Federation of Teachers, Seattle Local 1789, AFT Human and Civil Rights Committee, WFSC Local 304, and many more that came together to make this possible. Today, we honor and recognize the first peoples of this land, our perseverance, our determination, our values, and our resistance. A day to reflect on the lessons that we have learned since that fateful day colonialism first touched the shores of this continent. These lessons should inform us in how we move into the future. Considering all of the social, economic, environmental issues that we are facing today, there's no one that I'd rather hear from than our guest, Miss Winona LaDuc of the Mississippi Band of An Anishinaabe. My path has crossed with Miss Winona a few times over the years, from stiff policy DC meetings to secret activist training camps where we were training natives to work on um, working to stop the KXL pipeline. I can vouch that this woman has street cred uh, as well as academic credentials. Having graduated from both Harvard and Antioch universities, authoring six books and bringing some of the most critical issues to natives onto the national stage with her political run as a VP candidate on the Green Party's ticket with Ralph Nader. She's not someone who's afraid of getting her hands dirty. Ms. Winona Ludu now lives at her home on the White Earth Reservation as she continues her national work as the Executive Director of White Earth Land Discovery Project, raising more support and funding for Native-led environmental groups and projects. It's an honor to introduce you all to a prominent voice and fierce leader on American Indian social and environmental justice issues, Ms. Winona Blink. Thank you very much for the honor of being here with you today. You guys are really good organizers to get something organized so quickly. I know it's a great place to be. So, um, in my introduction, I just told you where I'm from, which is the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. Do you do y'all know where Minnesota is? <laughs> and, uh, I'm the Bear Clan, and. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show you a short video about kind of where I'm from so I don't have to act it out. And then I'm going to talk about this great celebration because um, I'm, I'm very, very proud to be here with you. Um, where are my technical friends? Just go here. Okay, so this is so I don't have to act it out. It's seven minutes. Hang in there. You're really going to like it. Okay? <laughs> Where's the audio? You guys got the audio up there? You have to turn it up on. Oh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> we rode our horses from the headwaters of the Mississippi River here on our reservation, along the proposed route of a new oil pipeline, which we crossed our reservation. It was a third of a series of rides on pipelines. We're not protesters or protectors. That's who we are. And this we call the Triple Crown of Pipeline Rides. Those rides took us on the Alberta Clipper proposed expansion route to the proposed Keystone Excel route in the Dakotas, where riders from the White Earth Reservation joined with the Lakota to ride between Mombly and Dakini on the Cheyenne River Reservation. 
So it was that 15 riders braved some harrowing terrain, a land littered with 100,000 dead cattle from a freak September blizzard and road that would pose Keystone Road. And then we came home to our own reservation, where a new pipeline is proposed to cut near our largest wild rice lake. That pipeline will carry fracked oil from the Dakotas. Much of this comes from the homelands of the Arikara, Mandan, and Hidatsa people, also known as the Fort Berthold Reservation, which is under assault by oil companies, and where water and people are challenged not only by a pipeline, but also by a proposed refinery. The other two pipelines carry tar sands oil from the far north in the Athabasca River, a place that is beautiful and a place that deserves to live and not become a national sacrifice area. Athabasca River region is a pristine ecosystem that is until the oil companies come that way. Thus far, 3% of that oil, considered because of its extraction method to be the dirtiest oil in the world, has been ripped from the ground. The boreal forests are being turned into sand dunes. Alberta has become the third largest oil producing state, aka nation, in the world. That oil is being extracted without infrastructure to move it. Hence the push for a pipeline, any pipeline. What's at stake is a lot of water and a lot of risk. In Minnesota, it's wild rice, water, and oil. The Enbridge Pipeline is proposing to both expand the present Alberta Clipper, doubling its capacity and making it the largest tar sands pipeline in the United States. In the Dakotas, it is a land without a single pipeline across it and one large aquifer, the Oglala. The Enbridge Company also wants to construct a 610-mile pipeline from near Tioga, North Dakota to Superior, Wisconsin. That would carry fracked oil. This is also the same oil as the 800,000 gallons which devastated a Tioga farm in North Dakota early in October. Farmer Stephen Jensen walked into his field and could smell the oil. It seeped for so long that 800,000 gallons devastated his field. That pipeline was six inches. The proposed sand pipeline is 30. Enbridge's pipelines are largely monitored by the company. Those go through indigenous territories which are healthy lands, lands that our ancestors wish to protect. We intend to do the same. The single largest pipeline oil spill in U.S. history was the Kalamazoo spill. The fact is that greed makes people act poorly. Rather than investing into efficiency, infrastructure, and renewable or safe energy, the push is to extract as quickly as possible by any means necessary and to move that oil by any means necessary. Right now, most of the oil moving in this country from the Bakken fields moves on railway. That's up to about 380,000 rail cars projected to move this year. This past summer, four square blocks of the town of Lac Morganti, Quebec, blew up as the train's braking systems failed. That train was carrying Bakken oil. Over 40 people were, quote, vaporized in an explosion which baffled Canadian authorities. They had never seen anything like it. That oil, combined with whatever chemicals are in it, is the stuff they want to put into the sand pipeline. The fact is, is that all of these expansions are predicated not on need, but on greed. We think that need is subjective. In Enbridge's application to the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, access to a, quote, stable supply of oil was the primary measure of need. It turns out that the world's largest oil reserves are in the Western Hemisphere, in Venezuela, followed by Saudi Arabia, and then the Alberta tar sands. Venezuela is a country that has demanded a fair price for oil and used that oil to develop its infrastructure. Instead of paying a fair price for oil, however, oil interests are far more interested in securing oil from places that do not wish to give up their oil.
land and water. This is what we are instructed to do by our ancestors, and that is our covenant with our ancestors and our Mother Earth. That is also our covenant with the generations yet to come. This is not just a native issue, an indigenous issue. It affects us all. Whether you have feet, wings, fins, or roots, we are all in this together. No corporation has a right to this land, water, and our future. This is what I'm going to do for honor the earth. She actually didn't want to move at all. That's what she has on sign. So she's praying in the spirit world all the way. I'm still not moving. Um, those are my kids, a couple of my sons, plus Frank Juan. And uh, those little tall kids are mine. That's last year at that climate rally in New York. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Any of you guys go to that? 400,000 people in New York City. You know what I'm talking about though? Yeah, so I sons. I raised, I raised six kids. I have uh, four boys and two girls. Um, so this is the second time I spoke at Indigenous Peoples Day. Last year was in Minneapolis, and it was a giant party. It was really great. It was like so liberating. You know, after all these years, I'm like a lot of you, I, you know, I had a lot of Columbus Day shoved down my throat for my whole life, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, most you know, I, I just wonder, like, uh, when the Columbus Day sales, does that mean you can just go in and take anything you want? <laughs> so I think it kind of should represent because that basically is how it all rolled out, right? Just kind of came in and took anything you wanted, everything else. But it is a great day when you when you liberate yourselves from that. So it's an honor to be here with the Duwamish people, the people of Seattle, the place of the Salish Sea renamed in 2009 by an enlightened state. And remembering our ancestors, those who sang, prayed here in this place, those who knew the secrets of creation, the stories of relatives with wings and fins and roots and paws as they emerged and nourished us. We honor those before us and we honor all here, those who have not yet arrived. And we reaffirm our place as a people who remember as the people who are here who do not suffer from historic amnesia, do not study, suffer from ecological amnesia, but are a people, a civil society that knows where it is exactly and is willing to be healthy enough and beautiful enough to survive. I could just do this too. I'm like, not without a finger. <laughs> huh? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, for some, it was palatable. A mystery of history. For many, it was palatable for many years. A mystery of history, which unfolded in the arrival of man who colonization was named for, Christopher Colon. You know, I was told once by this great native scholar, Steve Newcomb, and I'm, I'm still going to hold to it, that uh, colonization has the same root, same root word as colon. <laughs> Basically, it's the digestion of one culture by another. You know, in the economic, political, religious, military, governmental. You understand what I'm saying? 
but I think the origins actually probably with Christopher Colon, because that was his name. But the BC era did not exist for <clears throat> many Americans, myth told and retold in eras, an area of pernicious and historical amnesia. BC is before Columbus, before Cook, and before colonization. In historic amnesia, it's as if we did not exist, as if for 10,000 years we didn't fish here. If we did not make love to our husbands, make love to our wives, and create the finest of basket weaves with our, with our hands, and the greatest of technologies. And we if, as if we did not live the most elegant and intelligent of lives. So as I reflect on some of what we have historic in our history, there are 8,000 varieties of corn that came from the Western Hemisphere. Corn didn't exist in nature. You all know that, right? It's Tiusinti in nature. And so the 8,000 varieties that developed in the, of, the, of the hands and love and intelligence of corn breeders over all those years is when they took something that was so different and they turned it into so many varieties. It is an act of love. 900 varieties of potatoes created by our ancestors. And words like the, the, the Nahuatl words, Someone told me this a few years ago. Tomatl, potatl, chocolatl, and avocado are all Nahuatl words. Nahuatl people are from Mexico. Now, let us just be honest. Without chocolate, tomatoes, and potatoes, and world cuisine, most of the world's cuisine would really not exist to the quality it is. The Spanish brought the tomato to Europe, they say, in 1540. Actually, when you read it in Wikipedia, it says the Spanish brought the tomato to Europe. In 1540, cultivation became widespread. It's beginning in Spain. Well, you know, it's like they appeared from outer space. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying in that little citation? The Spanish brought the tomato to Europe. Really? Okay. Um, tobacco. Something else that came here, which to us, a sema is one of the great gifts we use for our prayers. It is also a curse. If they use correctly, it is a great gift, a great medicine for people. And climate knowledge. You know, there are these, uh, they're called uh, winter counts. They used to be painted on the sides of buffalo robes and teepees, uh, buffalo robes largely. How we kept track of historic events in the Northern Plains Territory. And so they would, they would paint it on a buffalo robe and uh, there's a winter count that refers to the year that the snow was above the tops of the teepees. That they estimate to be around 1830. You know, indigenous historical knowledge that precedes the climate knowledge that we have today. Pharmacology to heal and the magic of our medicines, whether it is the gift of quinine, aspirin, or ephedrine that which they continue the mind to mine the Amazon for today. All the pharma, pharmacology, as major corporations seek to go after and collect and privatize collective knowledge, intellectual and cultural property rights. A gift that was given by, by indigenous people to the United States was the gift of democracy, a representational democracy. You all know this, right? How many of you know this? much about the Iroquois Confederacy, because the Founding Fathers of the United States had no experience with democracy. Y'all know that, right? They came from feudalism and monarchy, a lot of oppression and a lot of prisons, right? Not necessarily the best framework from which to try to figure out how to make a new and great country or a new and great democracy. So they looked around, and the people who had a thousand years of representational democracy were the Iroquois Confederacy. Those people had confederated many years before, after many, many years of war. And what they did in their confederacy was is that first they, they stopped the war, which is where the great tree of peace came from, and the teachings of the peace. And they literally buried their hatchets underneath this great tree. And it took them a really long time to come to that peace, but when they came to that peace, they created a representational democracy. So Ben Franklin and all them guys went up there to, uh, take some notes on how to run a representational democracy, and they, they did a pretty good job, except for they had some very large omissions. Does anybody know the omissions of the, Iroquois, uh, of the American Constitution from the Iroquois? In the Iroquois society, 
Traditionally, and to this day, it is the clan mothers who appoint and remove the chiefs. And women in this country did not get the right to vote till much later. And of course, when democracy was formed in the United States, the only people who could vote were white men who owned land, which would exclude, exclude I'd say, about 60 or 70 percent of the people in this room, right? There are a lot of lessons that have not yet been secured, and that are lessons which need to be uh, need to come from our societies. So, for instance, in a world or in the United States where uh, we have created essentially, do you guys like that? Customers a punk one. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's better than just looking at me the whole time, right? Okay. Um, in a society where uh, we have the highest number of prisoners per capita of anyone in the world, of the approximately 9 million prisoners in the world, you know, the 2.2 million of them live in the United States, right? Y'all know this, right? In that, uh, that is not an indicator of a healthy society. It is not an indicator of a healthy society when you have a growth industry in prisons. That is not something you want for civil society. And one of the great things which was missed um, is the restorative justice systems of indigenous people. So for instance, in 1885, the Major Crimes Act was passed after ex parte Crow Dog had killed Spotted Tail, a chief, on the Rosebud Reservation. The punishment that was given by the traditional Lakota people was is that there had to be reparations paid from the Crow Dog family to the Spotted Tail family that they had to care for them for the generation ahead because Spotted Tail, in Spotted Tail's assassination, Crow Dog had denied that family the person who would feed them. And so the other family was now responsible for feeding. The Major Crimes Act actually sentenced Crow Dog to death. That is a punitive justice system as opposed to a restorative justice system. And at this point in time, I think we would be a wise society to consider that indigenous peoples had no jails. And that to come to a society where a restorative justice system exists rather than a punitive justice system exists would be an evolution to an enlightened society. In terms of economic systems, I will, I will, I will suggest to you that an economic system that is based on the consuming of more than you need and the taking of more than you need and not leaving the rest. It's not a system that will last forever. That in fact the idea of the West is a frontier, at a certain point you run out of places to colonize. You run out of people's lands to take. You run out of resources to extract for private property. And you run out of the ability to live in such a world. In an indigenous economic system, the fact is, is that wealth is viewed in terms of the generosity of your gifts. For instance, the potlatch, and in most indigenous communities, the giveaway. Your social status is associated with your generosity. It is not associated with your ability to hoard, your ability to be greedy or your ability to emulate the Koch brothers. <laughs> Public policy wisdom that could be secured from indigenous people would include an amendment to the Constitution called the Seventh Generation, seventh generation Amendment. We live in a society in which private property is protected under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. It is protected to such a level to, that today corporations are viewed as natural persons under the law. I do not believe that a corporation is a person. But American law upholds the rights of corporations. And today, as in the case that you saw of our territory, we are fighting the right of a Canadian corporation to have imminent domain over our territory. There is no corresponding protection of common property in the Constitution. There is no protection of the commons. And so what occurs in the world today is that private corporations are allowed to sully our waters, 
to over-harvest the collective fish that the Creator put here for all of us and put here to live unto themselves. That corporations are allowed to spew poisons and carbon into the air. And that their rights as private property rights are viewed as paramount to the rights of the commons or the rights of the rest of us. A more enlightened society would look towards intergenerational equity. Would learn from the knowledge of people like the Six Nations Confederacy, who say, as do many indigenous nations, that in each deliberation today, deliberations, for instance, on public policy, in each deliberation, we should consider the impact upon the seventh generation from now. Because we are the ones who are here. And what we do now will, in fact, impact them all. We are the ones who are enlightened and have the spiritual opportunity to do the right thing. And public policy in the, and a government, in my mind, should reflect the values of intergenerational equity and interspecies equity. And that we do not have the right to make the salmon paupers in their own rivers or in their own ocean. We do not have the right to destroy their habitat so that they can no longer live. In interspecies equity, we understand in Dinaway Muganatuk, fundamental teaching of the Anishinaabe, which is that we are all related. Now, Seattle is getting pretty enlightened, but I'm not yet seeing that they have become as enlightened as Bolivia, or the Ho-Chunk Nation, who adopted the rights of Mother Earth as public policy indicators and edicts on how you carry out your policies. The Ho-Chunk Nation in Wisconsin just adopted the rights of Mother Earth, noting that Mother Earth has a right to continuance, to be honored, and we do not have a right to destroy rivers or life forms. So those are some things that we could still evolve to and that we basically need to evolve to as a North American society. And in the post-colonial era, the post-Columbus era that we are now entering. So let's talk a little bit about uh, maybe some things that Seattle could do, and maybe some larger questions. So here, you know, it is wrong that the Duwamish are not recognized. That's wrong. You know, it is wrong that the, the people who were here first are not recognized. These people here that went to are not recognized either. And you know, what I have found in, in my many years of wandering is that there is a direct relationship between the price of real estate and your ability to get secure federal recognition. That is why it took the Wampanoags of Cape Cod so long. That is why Native Hawaiians still do not have standing under the law. The price of real estate, of the territory that is your territory, that is now occupied by others, should not become the factor that determines whether or not you are a human being and whether you are not a people. So I look forward to supporting the Duwamish people in their recognition. Shell has invaded your harbor. I was really proud of y'all uh, when you sent Shell packing last time. Yeah. I was really good. Give yourselves all hand for that. <laughs> I did read that uh, you know that they aren't necessarily giving up the, their their interest in the harbor though. Huh? They're back. They're back. That's what I heard. So. You saw a little bit of what we're facing in our territory, right? 
and it is different terrain, but what I will tell you is that my community, you know, we're the largest Ojibwe reservation in Minnesota, and everything we have, we have fought for. And every statistic you don't want to have, we have still. You know, we're considered poor people. We have a third of our people with diabetes. We have a lot of incarcerations, particularly our young men. We have, uh, you know, uh, but what we learned a long time ago is that uh, no one was going to take care of stuff for us. You know, waited for justice from the federal government, we did not get justice. Long time ago, we waited for our tribal government to take care of things, and they all went to jail. So we didn't get, we didn't get that either. So we looked around our community and we said, well, we may not be the smartest people. We may not be the wealthiest people. We may not be the richest people. We may not be the best looking people. But we're the ones who live here. And so we're going to make some changes. You know? And that's a lot of the work that we've, I've been privileged to be part of in my past, since I got out of college. You know, recovering our land. Uh, recovering control over our wild rice crop. Putting up wind turbines. Recovering f control over a lot of our food system. So we didn't import everything from someplace else. And that our people could eat the food that nourishes not only our bellies, but our souls. So that is uh, what we do in our community. And so when they announced these pipelines, we pretty much said, that's not going to work out. You know? So we've been in a three-year battle against the largest pipeline company in North America. Uh, they have no pipelines in there now. It would be not an easy battle, though, you know, I'm telling you that, because uh, power does not give up, right? They just reload. But what I know about them is that uh, I fought a lot of stupid projects. Most of my adult life, I fought a lot of stupid projects. I call them that, you know, I'm an economist by training. But what I really want to do is, and what I am working on is the post-petroleum economy. But sometimes you gotta fight the bad guys on your way to post-petroleum economy. Y'all got that, right? So the bad guys got a lot of stupid proposals in the last moments of the fossil fuel era. You know, in these moments of the fossil fuel era where we've entered into extreme extraction is when you blow off the top of 500 mountaintops in Appalachia. That's extreme behavior. When you drill 20,000 feet under the ocean and hope that's going to work out until you get the deep water horizon, right? Or when you do something like, you know, the tar sands. That's extreme behavior. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And fracking, blowing up the bedrock of Mother Earth, that's extreme behavior. It's extreme addictive behavior at the end of a fossil fuel era because anything that is there now is all that is left. And these guys are just really trying to get it all out. And the fact is, is that if they are able to do that, to get that out, that will not, that will not work out for any of us. That will not work out for any of us. And so we spend a lot of time stopping them. And what I know is that the longer you fight a project, the longer you fight a project, the more expensive that project gets to that company. I've seen it happen time and time again. And you know that you have won when they say it is no longer economically feasible to mine. We have deemed this project no longer economically feasible. They never say you were right. They never say we recognize that we would have violated the human rights of people. They just say it's not economically feasible. So I encourage you young people, as you're thinking, just remember you've got to be very, very diligent, Dig in, but always keep your eye on where it is we're going. So in my community, you know, uh, this last year, I rode my horse out in Washington, D.C., me and my sister, there's some pictures of us riding our horse out in Washington, seeing this Cowboys and Indians. We're uh, opposing the Keystone XL pipeline, you all know what I'm talking about for the video, right? So I rode our horses in Washington, D.C., and. Uh, you know, with the cowboys. 
an Indian said, no. I just like saying that too, that I rode my horse in Washington, D.C. Y'all got that, right? So I ride my horse in Washington, D.C. in a place you don't really want to ride your horses in Washington, D.C. You know, so there's like cops, there's like flashing lights, there's sirens, there's banners, and there's people who want to take a picture of you. Just terrifying, right? So anyway, I rode my horse, and then we rode our horses, and then we went over to our teepee, which is on the Washington Mall. Well, that sounds cool, right? I was hanging out at my teepee at the Washington Mall. Y'all follow me on this? <laughs> hanging out at my teepee in the Washington Mall, having a good time. Neil Young comes, hangs out at my teepee in the Washington Mall. Daryl Hannah's hanging out at my teepee at the Washington Mall. And my two 15-year-old sons, who you saw pictures of at the beginning, are hanging out at my teepee in the Washington Mall. And so I was hanging out my TV in the Washington Mall, and this guy comes and sticks his head in the TV, and he says, Miss LaDuke, would you like to go for a ride in my car? And I'm looking at this guy going, that is like such a great 80s pickup line, buddy. <laughs> uh, it's like an 80s pickup line. I was like looking at him going, why would I go for a ride in your car? And, like, and my 15-year-old sons are going, no, Mom, you're not going for a ride in that guy's car. They're looking at me going, no. And I'm looking at the guy, and the guy says, um, it's a Tesla. And I'm like, yeah, I'd like to go for a ride in your car. <laughs> so I walked out of my teepee into a, into a red four-door Tesla, right? And uh, we, we took a little ride. We went over to see my friend Ralph Mater, actually. And uh, basically what I realized was that that's what I want. I want an elegant transition. I don't want to crash my way out of the fossil fuel era. I don't want any more wars for oil. I don't want any more African-American communities drowned in refinery smut. You know? I don't want any more bomb trains. And I don't want any pipelines shoved down my throat. And I don't want wars in my shoes. And uh, And it is entirely possible to do that. And there's a direct relationship between the environmental justice issues of climate change and the human rights issues and our choices as people today. And the reason I know it is possible, and that you guys got to hold the line against uh, Shell Oil, is I was reading this great article in my Harvard Magazine, which is super funny because if any of you, when you guys go off to college, you'll realize that your college will send you letters to donate to them until you are in your 50s, even if you have never donated to them. I'm thinking that the Harvard Endowment is fine. Y'all get what I'm saying? Without my, you know, 10 bucks. They're good. They're just fine. So they're not getting any money from me still. But I read my Harvard Magazine, and there's this woman named Mara Prentice in it. And Mara Prentice is a uh, physics professor at Harvard. And she points out, she's like absolutely the geekiest woman I've ever seen, and she's super smart. Anyway, I read this article about Mara Prentice, and she talks about the reason that we're going to transition into a post-fossil fuels era, and the reason is, is that the combustion engine in my car, in your car, is 16% efficient. So you put in six gallons of gas, and you get a gallon of gas, which actually moves that beast that you're driving around in. And that's not an enlightened way to live. An electric engine is 65% efficient. And so, as we move forward, we would rather live in an enlightened society, which destroys less. The challenge is, is how we move to that. Unless we are in a super bad case of denial, which collectively America is in a pretty good case of it, we might have, you know, if, if you were not in that denial, you would have noticed that the hottest day on record ever occurred, occurred this year, right? 165 degrees in Iran. That was the heat index. That is not normal planetary behavior. And that is us. We did that. You would have noticed that there's 27 inches of rainfall that just fell in South Carolina. And all of us would probably know or will know pretty quickly that it'll be about uh, in 2020, which is about Five years from now, they project that we'll be spending 20% of world GDP on climate change related disasters. I have no idea what our plan is for that. I know that we live in a country where your Skagit Bridge collapsed. 
right? We live in a country that has a D in infrastructure. But yet the energy industry is trying to shove 50, 100 billion dollars worth of new pipelines and infrastructure down our throats. And pretend that that is what we need in this country. And what we need, in fact, is gas mains that do not blow up in cities, bridges that do not crumble, and water for people to drink. A train system that would not be an embarrassment to Bulgaria, right? And a way of life that is elegant. So let us make that beautiful life in this beautiful world. There's a few things we can do here, all of us. In Seattle, you need to make sure that you clean your water and don't poison it. Don't let them put more stuff in it, you know? That's what we're doing in our territory. We're saying, you know, it does not mix. In fact, we're running this little campaign because last year, did y'all know that this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month? See, of course, I, I thought it was in February, and I just, so we just started this campaign, which is Pipeline Free for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. You can find us online. But the reason I did this is that last year, during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, this company, um, Baker Anders, I think, or Baker Daniels, makes drill bits for fracking, fracking oil, right? And they made a thousand pink drill bits in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And then they gave $100,000 to the Susan Coleman Foundation for Breast Cancer Research. And I don't think you get to pink wash your destruction of the planet, right? So, you know, I'm encouraging people, you can follow us a little bit online. This is what North Dakota looks like right now. And we have these, you can post with them singularly. And if you want to send your pictures to us at Honor the Earth, or you can also post with them double. <laughs> For Breast Cancer Awareness Month, that's if you're cheekier, you can do that. So anyway, just think about it. We believe that breasts should be pipeline free. For Breast Cancer Awareness Month, that's our campaign. <coughs> Clean your water, don't poison us. Let's make things beautiful. Now that guy, Masuro Emoto, oh, some of you have to leave, I'm almost done, but if you gotta leave, that's good. Masuro Emoto, you know that guy who says beautiful things to water crystals? You know what I'm talking about? You say it's ugly, that crystal's ugly, if it's dirty, but if you pray, it makes it beautiful. Let us do that. Let us have water purification systems which clean we cover abalone earrings the size that our ancestors had. They had some big abalone earrings. And return to a time when there is a calendar without empire. In my language, this month is called Benakweogesis, which is when the leaves fall. The moon that follows this is Gashkadnogesis. The one that follows that is Manitou Gizis Soons, Gishi Manitou Gizis, Great Spirit Moon, the May Bene Gizis, Onawabana Gizis, High Crested Snow Moon. Are you all leaving me? Just some? I'm almost done. Those are moons in our calendar. Do you all hear kind of those moons? The May Bene Gizis, the Sucker Moon, Iskigami Ziki Gizis, the Maple Sugar Moon, Wabagana Gizis, the Flower Moon, Mean Gizis, Blueberry Moon, Oday Mene Gizis. Those are the moons in an Ojibwe calendar. But what you might have noticed is that none of those moons is named after a Roman emperor. <laughs> Did y'all notice that? So it is possible to have an entire worldview that is beyond empire. <laughs> and that is, to me, what the beginning of Indigenous Peoples Day is about this re-envisioning world of Ma'a King where we have peace between each other. And we live in a society that is beyond empire. So I want to thank you for your time. I'd be happy to have a few questions if you like from me, which very much.
Jason. Anybody wants to stay? We've got time for one or two questions. Nice outfit, buddy. Very cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a great day. That's right. Enjoy those tomatoes and your marinara sauce.